it on set. Okay. okay. Tarot Documentary presents Filming in Thailand, a podcast for movie lovers with exclusive stories from behind the scenes. Rolling sound. Sound rolling. And action. Hi, I'm your host Stéphane Lambert, and this is a new episode of Filming in Thailand. Here we are. This is a new episode of Filming in Thailand with our guest Les Nardhauser, a discreet yet extremely active producer. Welcome to Filming in Thailand, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Les, uh, can I call you Les? Yes, please. Are you filming in Thailand? All the time. As often as possible. Thank you very much. And <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting time right now because uh, a lot of the shows have been on hold because of the Screen Actors Guild strike and the Writers Guild strike. So um, we're in a process of, of budgeting and scheduling and, and planning. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm <laughs> very concerned that as soon as the strikes end in the U.S., there's going to be such a barrage of, of uh, material coming in that, that we're all going to be crazy busy. That's quite positive. Negative for now and positive. It, it's not negative now. I mean, now is, is the calm before the storm. I think everybody in town is going to get really, really busy. I mean, we've been busy. We've been doing things along the way. But, but right at this very moment... Uh, there seems to be a pause, and, and that's giving us a chance to sort of get everything in ready. So that's what's going on. So I have your uh, the information available about you uh, online. Online. <laughs> Anything good? <laughs> yeah, actually, yes, and a lot. So um, what's, what, uh, what's striking here is that, so they say uh, that you had a diverse, diverse career. Uh, you are... Um, White water river rafting guides, key instructor. I, I've had really three three ongoing careers at the same time, and 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 one has been visual media. I mean, I was a commercial still photographer in LA with a studio, and and uh, film and television, of course, um, and education. I mean, I, I've been teaching and administrating education for decades, and I mean, schools. Yeah, I, I've I've been uh, academic department chair for two departments at a film school. I've taught at various universities here in the U.S. and various other countries. Um, I'm always I have an ongoing workshop where I'm teaching people uh, just to grow them. I mean, part of what I like to do that I really like to do is look for new talent and and bring them up. Um, and the third has been outdoor adventure. Um, I was. Uh, Ski instructor, ski patrol for almost 25 years, and I was a uh, white. In Thailand, no, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> and I was a whitewater rafting guide for about 18 years, and again, not in Thailand. So, so yeah, I've had all of those things all the time. So you start up your company to to <clears throat> to support a business you were bringing in, or you start up the company and then look for for clients. I actually started the company without even knowing what I was going to be doing. Um, I, I had been I had been producing a film in the Philippines, and I was working with someone that was based here. And I was coming back to Thailand after the film in the Philippines, and I was going to go to the beach and write a book. And while I was thinking about that, uh, he said, you know, why don't we start a company? I said, what are we going to do? He said, production services. I said, what's that? <laughs> that, that's how, that's how whimsical that was, and uh, and and we ended up doing it, and and uh, he went off to start his own after a couple of years, and I kept it, and and uh, part of what we do is production services. Part of what I do aside from that is is development and producing of our own projects. I have a quote. We like uh, quotes here at Filming in Thailand. For me, it's uh, for the next episode. We will quote you. <laughs> So there is this quote from Quentin Tarantino. He said, probably he said somewhere, right? that is someone wrote it under his name. He says, uh, producers are the ones who provide the canvas and the paint for the director's masterpiece. You know, it, 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 it's interesting because when I started in this part of the business, film and television, I was creative first. I was a writer, producer, director. I've written features that have been produced. I've been a staff writer on TV series. Um, I, I've uh, 
produced a fair bit of television and, and, uh, you know, and I have directed, I don't know, 150, 200 multi-camera, uh, episodes of TV shows. So, so my approach to this is, is, is a little bit different than others. I switched gears and wanted to know how it all went together. And that's when I became a UPM line producer and all that. What is UPM, uh, right? Uh, un unit production manager. Okay. Um, the way I think of it, the, the, the UPM is the captain of the ship. When I was a UPM and a line producer, and a lot of times I was both at the same time, um, there was nothing that happened related to that show that I was not involved in. I, I, I knew when every screw showed up to the set, I, I, I was involved in it. You know, one of my favorite questions, this is, this is a, a good question that I ask people, who is the direct boss of the first assistant director? And what would your answer be? The, the director. And, and the answer is no. Um, the answer is that the first AD is trying to get the director everything he or she wants as long as it fits into the parameters set by the, the UPM. So if you, if you go to the Directors Guild of America and you look at the line, uh, you know, the, the, the line, director is over on one side and it's UPM first AD, second AD, second, second AD. So the first AD is answering directly to the UPM. <laughs> It's a funny business because we're in the communication business and you'd be surprised how many people in the business don't know how to communicate, you know, but, but it is, has got to be constant communication. Um, the director's got to tell us what he or she wants. We've got to make sure that fits into the parameters of the budget and the schedule set by the UPM based on the parameters set by the producer. And it all works together. <laughs> I was about to ask you, then who's the boss of the UPM? The producer. The producer. Yeah. Definitely not anybody else. It, you know, the UPM is protecting the show. If, if, the produ if the UPM's in trouble, the show's in trouble. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm going to give you a quick 30-second lesson. And this, Please. Gives you, this, this is my personal uh, approach to it. I look at it at, when you're going into a film or a TV series, you're, you're kind of going into war. It's the same mentality. So you've got a bunch of generals on the top, and that's the producers and the directors and the executive producers. And then you've got the captain of the ship that is the UPM. And that captain has three lieutenants. One is the production coordinator who runs the office. One is the first AD who runs the set. And the other is the production accountants that, that are fine watching the finance. And if those three are communicating well with the UPM, everything should go smoothly. Then, of course, he's overseeing all the department heads of the whole show, but those three are the nucleus with the UPM. So now you are describing the, the mechanic of yeah, the production. Absolutely. Doesn't touch the creative side. It doesn't touch the creative side, it, it supports the creative side. So, you know, you, you asked me earlier about situations. I, I had a situation where a, a director was also the producer and basically said, we're, we want to do this film with you and we're going to give you a fixed amount and anything over that you're responsible for. I said, well, wait a minute. So, so if all of a sudden three... Responsible means you have to... Financially. So I said, so, so if all of a sudden three helicopters show up that you've ordered, well, yeah, you have to pay for it. I, I said, thank you very much. We're done. <laughs> There is no business like show business, and there is no show without the business. Correct. Um, is this something that uh, you, you find well understood in Thailand? Yes, actually. I, I, I don't have any issues in Thailand. It's, it's, it's the foreign companies that come in, and you know, you'll, you'll, once in a while, you'll, you'll get somebody that hasn't done this before internationally, and they're jumping up and down saying, this isn't how we do it in New York. And, and my reaction is to very quietly say, can you do me a favor? Look around 360 degrees. You're not in New York. It's not going to be New York. We do it the way we do it and embrace this. And, and, you know, I've worked in a lot of countries and I learned that early on. You know, when I worked in India, it was a different scene. When I worked in the Philippines, different scene, et cetera, et cetera. So, so... Any, you know, anybody that's going internationally, you have to embrace the culture and listen for a while before you start saying, this is how we do it, because what you do might not be the way it's done locally. You are listening to Filming in Thailand, 
a podcast by Tarot Documentary with your host, Stefan Lambert. And we are back with multi-talented producer Les Nordhauser. And I have a, a second quote for you. This one is from an actress. Her name is uh, Kate Blanchett. Uh, do you know her? I wish. <laughs> so you see, you don't know everybody. I, I appreciate her though. <laughs> okay. As she says, uh, producers are the silent conductors guiding actors to deliver their best performances. Would you agree with that? The right producer. I mean, you know, the, the, the name producer has been thrown around a lot and, and there are different types of producers and people don't always know what they do. You know, one of the intriguing things, because we do a lot of television and film, is that the executive producer in, in features are, are, is generally more involved in the financing of the film where uh, the producer is the main person sort of running things. And in television, the executive producer is quite often the screenwriter and, and the showrunner. And they're the big dog and the producer somewhere lower down on the land. So it, it really depends. Most often, the producer finds the project first. And it's, it's his or her vision. Now, that person ha hires the director more often than not. And then it becomes the director's vision. But if it's working well, they're, they're sort of working together to create that vision. You know, the, the beautiful thing about filmmaking is it's a team sport. There's nobody working in a vacuum. You asked me before, it's like everybody's there to support the director's vision. Yes, as long as it fits into everybody else's vision. You know, unless you're, you're Steven Spielberg. And, and in, that, in that case, you would also be the producer. You'd, you'd be everything. And everybody bows down when you walk in, and, and, and that's a different conversation. But, but for, for your average, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen recently Oppenheimer. Spectacular film. And one of the things that stood out for me was that um, they got all of those celebrity famous actors in the same room at the same time. I said, how did they do that? And everybody in the room said, Christopher Nolan called. I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so so in, in those cases, you know, that, that person is pretty much running things, but he or she also st still needs to be aware of, of the parameters of the production. So it's a collaboration. But that, that's why uh, people have so much fantasy about this business. So fantasies about this business. Uh, who's doing what is not very clear unless you're in on it. set in it. And then you know that um, money talks, who started the project and who has the, I was about to say the largest ego in the room, but it's not about ego, it's who has the largest uh, audience, successes, uh, maybe knowledge of the, of the mechanic of the business. You know, who, who, why are you there is a, is a part of it. Are That's you a, a recurrent question on the set? You know, but, you but, look around and you say, why are you there? <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, are you there because, I mean, the script it drives everything, but then are you there because of this producer? Are you there because of that director? Are you there because they were able to get this superstar actor, Kate Blanchett, for instance? You know, it, it really depends what the draw is. And, and, um, but, you know, everybody in the world wants to be a director. There is a saying in France, if you, if you can do something, you know, uh, do it if you cannot teach. But it seems that you're teaching and you can do what you're teaching about. Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I learn, I, I have to tell you, I learn from teaching. You learn from teaching? Always, always. They make me think about things that I haven't thought about. They ask questions that I haven't considered. And they make me do the homework to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. So, so you know, teaching has always been rewarding. I mean, people ask me why I do it. And, and my standard answer is because I, I, I like to see the light bulbs go on, which is true. But I also learn from them all the time. You know, my, my philosophy has always been I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be surrounded by them. <laughs> and, and so, you know, if, if I can gather the smartest people, then I've done my job. And how do you feel today in this room? No, don't answer I, that. I, I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> You're the guy with the show. <laughs> <laughs> but the show won't exist without you today. <laughs> well, thank you. So how do you balance this, the feeling of, you know, uh, having to, uh, to give uh, people the tools and the abilities to, to, uh, to perform, to go through the project, uh, um, and uh, 
your creative mind that I'm sure, you know, kicks in once in a while and say, ah, I would not do it this way. I would not frame it this way. I, 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 how, how do you manage that? Is, is it a, a, a question of managing your ego when you know that you could do a better job than the director or you feel you could do a better job than the director? If, if, there, is, if, if there is something really significant that a director is not seeing, depending on who the director is, and depending on my relationship with the director, if I feel comfortable and if I, if I feel they're going to take it the right way, I'm never going to say you got it all wrong. But I might say, have you considered this? Just another idea. And, and, and you know, you, you want to be very, I mean, listen, directors like actors, you know, have, have fragile egos. And what you never want to do is have them feel you're questioning them. But if you can show them something that's going to make the shot better, and I rarely do this, but if I see something that's really going to be a big difference, um, you know, I, if, the, if the opportunity is right, maybe I'll say something and it'll be, you know, hey, I had a thought and, and you can tell me to go away if you want. But what do you think of this? Do you have a specific example where your input changed the, the way it went, on, went to the screen, the way it was crafted? Or an example of, you involving and then it goes terribly wrong. Everybody gets angry. It doesn't work the way you... I, you know, I'm not going to mention names here and I'm not going to mention the show even. <clears throat> But I will tell you a particular situation. We were working on a film here a few years ago and we had um, a Hollywood star. He wasn't an A-level star. It was a B-level star. And there was a particular scene in this film where... It was late at night, and, and the, the, the story was about, this particular scene was about two of the characters talking, it's two women talking, and he was behind them in a car and, and in the passenger seat, and they were going to shoot the two of them, and through them, you'd see him listening in. And I hear roll camera, roll, uh, roll sound, cut. And I see all of a sudden everybody running around and moving everything to a different place. I said, I went to the director. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, the actor in the car thought we should shoot through the car to the two ladies. And I said, this scene isn't about him. He said, I know, but you know, you want to keep him happy. I said, I wouldn't want to keep him that happy. You know, it's like, <laughs> really? Didn't make sense. You know, and he said, well, I'm going to go with it this way. We'll try to shoot one after, but you know. And, and that's all you can do. I mean, you know, I'm not going to stir up all that. But. So did you see the, 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 the Finnish film that went on? Yeah, and it went the way he wanted. Yeah, so. <laughs> Was that that bad, finally? It, it, it wasn't appropriate. <laughs> Production services, that, that the key word. So you are welcoming um, celebrities, people that are, you know, busy. They represent a lot of, uh, a lot of business, a lot of money. Um, they they come to Thailand and they have a certain maybe certain ex certain expectations about the country or about the way people are interacting with them. Um, can it, can this be a, a, I would say a driving force on set, or um, sometimes you know you you have to deal with people that have not the right behavior or not the right interaction with people. How, how do you manage that with those celebrities? I've got a few thoughts about that. Um, one, one philosophy I've had my whole career is that you want to treat people that want to be celebrities like they are celebrities, and you want to pe treat people that are celebrities like normal people, and, and it works every time. You know, um, and, and, and again, I won't mention names, but people that are very famous don't want everybody around them just bowing down to them all the time. They want somebody to go, hey, Brad, hey, you know, it's like normal. And, and the people, the young stars coming up, they want to be treated like royal. You know, you'll get a producer or a director or an actor who's a screamer. Mm -hmm. And I cannot tell you the number of times I've gone up to somebody and said, you cannot scream at my crew because Thai crew would rather be unemployed than yelled at. And I said, I'm dead serious. You have two choices. Keep it to yourself. Go out onto the woods and scream or yell at me because I'm from New York and I can handle it <laughs> and not scream at my crew. That's really true. And, and if you can't control yourself, then don't talk to my crew. I've said that before. 
And and it is true. I mean, we all, we've all heard stories. I fortunately haven't had it on my set, but we've all heard stories about entire departments just disappearing because somebody got yelled at. And we can imagine that those people who are screamers, as you said, uh, they go back to their place and they stop screaming at people. <laughs> well, we can have, we can hope. <laughs> we, we can hope. You know, or maybe they think, God, ah, the tide crews, they just left. Yeah, you know. So so who knows? But but um I mean that that's something to be very, very aware of. You are listening to Filming in Thailand, a podcast by Tarot Documentary, with your host, Stefan Lombert. And we are still filming in Thailand with our guest, the multi-talented Les Nordhauser. Do I pronounce your name correctly? It's actually Nordhauser. Nordhauser. Where is it from? It's from Germany. I'm not from Germany, but my dad was. So Nord could be North. Yes. House of the North. Nordhauser. Yeah. Les. I'll call you Les. Okay. Fair enough. When you are the creative, when you are the, the driving force behind a project, what is your approach to get the money in your project, being based in Thailand? Please give us precise name, numbers. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and they're going to give me how much? <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a puzzle that you put together. And and the driving force always is the script or the story or, or the concept, depending on what genre you're in. Um, once you've got that and that's solid, there are four other parts to put this whole puzzle together. One is the on-screen talent, one is the director, one is the financing, one is the distribution. The more of those you get, the easier it is to get the others. And um, I had a conversation just recently, this past week, with a producer from LA who happened to be here. And what he was telling me um, that currently the, in, the on-camera talent is the most important aspect. If I've got and I'm just going to throw a name out sure. there. If I've got Brad Pitt there or Kate Blanchett or, or anything like that, money's going to come. Okay. You know, if, if, if I don't, if I've got, uh, you know, Joe Smith from, from Kansas and nobody's heard of him, why are they putting money into this thing? The reason these guys and gals get as much as they do is because they bring eyeballs to the screen. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, so, so that's a part of it. Um, it, it's very challenging to just show someone a story, a script, and have them throw money at you. So you would say um, actors are the number one element? Seems lately. They're, they're, they're a big, you know, I, are they the number one? No, but they're a big part of it. So how do you deal with that from Thailand? Can you, can you initiate a project in Thailand or even a Thai project uh, um, with then you don't have so much access to uh, to international talents, not not to mention American talent, and still get some interest. You know, my again, my background is twenty years in Hollywood, and and you know, I I did a lot there. I was I was very involved politically there. I, I was chairman of the American Association of Producers for a couple of terms. I was vice, pre vice president of Motion Pictures of the Producers Guild of America. I'm still an honorary board member there. So I, I do have a lot of connection there. I have a branch of my company in, in the U.S. But you're not on strike today. I am not on okay, strike. Okay, please continue. I'm not on strike. If I was acting, maybe I would be. <laughs> um, nah, but, but you know, so, so I'm not that far removed. I mean, I start my day almost every day with Zoom calls to the U.S. Okay. Okay, so so I, I, I am very much, you know, and if it's important enough, I can be there in 24 hours. You know, so so um, it's, it's, I look more at Thailand and Southeast Asia as my backdrop. I, I'm not necessarily, and, and occasionally it happens, but most of my projects are, are, more geared toward a global audience than it just a Thai audience. Global audience would mean an American-based project? Uh, well, again, American-based, what does that mean? Um, is it, the audience being American? Sure, but I have no problem doing it here. You know, there is the, the Thai film office that is producing uh, statistics on uh, how many films has, uh, were shot in Thailand, films, documentaries, music videos, programs, etc., and when I look at the, the figures from October 22 to July 23, uh, 
I see that uh, the, the overall turnover of the industry is almost 200 million US dollar. Okay. Uh, how much is going, how much of this is going through your company? Half? A third? 199. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm asking you this question <laughs> this way, it's because before COVID, is, is, it was quite spread out or spread um, uh, through all these companies, 800 companies uh, pro uh, providing pr production services in Thailand. Then you had COVID. The most of the turnover uh, uh, came through few companies that that were able to attract large productions from you know big players, um, and today it start to to come back uh, to a mix of this heavy concentration and um, you know a, a bit of food for everybody. That's why I'm asking in a provocative way how much of this is going through you, and 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 I can't tell you that, but I can tell you this that. We were affected dynamically uh, with COVID. Uh, we were doing literally dozens of projects every year through 2019. And then 2020, 2021, it really dropped off dramatically. And and the reason was, and you hit it just right, if, if there was an international production, they had to be strong enough with a big enough budget that they could put their entire crew that they were bringing in and actors in quarantine for two weeks, pay them what they're paying them. I mean, th th those are $100 million films. You know, if you've got a $5 million film, it's like, yeah, I don't think we want to do that. You know, so so we definitely went down during that time. Uh, we did a few projects, but nothing significant. Last year, it came back quite a bit more. This year has been, um, uh, for us, uh, a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, we've had some really good times and some really, eh, not much going on now. This is... The time traveling machine. We, we have the time machine here. So if we use our time machine and we are back in time and you are, you can meet your 20 years old self, what would you ask or, or, or tell yourself? Become a lawyer. No, only kidding. Um, you know what? I'm, I've been very happy with my life. I don't know that I would change a lot. Um, are there points along the way that that, you know, I could have gone one way and I went another way and, and, um, you know, everybody's got that, but I have no regrets. So what would you tell yourself? What would I tell you? Be, be more patient, be more proactive, uh, uh, don't doubt, uh, go for a holiday now because you won't have any chance later on. <laughs> I, you know, I think that it's a good question and, and I don't have any simple answer for that. I think if I was going to look at myself at 20, I think, now I came from a relatively small town. And at 20, I was still there. Um, I hadn't traveled out of the country other than Canada up to that point. And I, was, I, I lived three and a half hours away from Canada. So, so, you know, I would probably make myself much more aware of the whole world out there that's, that's needs to be explored. You know, there, there are things that, you know, I've thought about it in different ways, not if I was 20, but if I had a, a, a 20 year old kid, what would I say to them? And, and uh, you know, there's certain things that I would really suggest just for life experience. Um, and, and they're unrelated to film, actually. You know, go, go for a year somewhere and learn how to cook. I mean, really cook. Sure. Learn for a couple of years, really learn music really well. Because those things bring people together wherever you are on the planet. And then take a year to two years and travel around the world and see as much as you can see. Then you're ready. So we'll remember that your advices are learn how to cook, play music very well, and travel. That, that's, these three things are really nice. You know, it's an interesting thing. I, I come from the U.S. and I haven't lived there in 20 years. Um, but I'm looking at it right now, and I'm watching all these knuckleheads that are that are ranting and raving, and I'm thinking, those are the ones that don't have passports, because what happens is, <laughs> the, the the more that you've traveled, and especially if you've had a chance to live in a different culture, you start realizing that it's not all about you. You know, you're not the center of the universe, and you become much more tolerant. Tolerant. You become much more socially aware. I mean, I've lived. For 20 years in, in in countries where in a whole region where there's not a lot of me 
and 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 you you become much more accepting. You know what? Maybe I'm the odd guy out. You know, when I first went to India the first day, when I was vice president of production for Sony, literally the first day, I was interested inter, uh, introduced to about 420 people who I had never seen before. I had never heard those kind of names before. Next day, they're all going, "Hey, Les." I'm going, uh, uh, "Hi," <laughs> you know, and and it's humbling. It's humbling. It's humbling. It's the same thing, you know, the first time I went to Vietnam and I was asking about the Vietnam War and they didn't know what I was talking about. And, and then somebody said to me, are you talking about the American War? And holy smokes, was that, that, that was a light bulb moment for me. It's like, wow, it ain't about us. Les, we are reaching the end of our show today, um, but before we part, we have a special gift for you if uh, Fiat is uh, kind enough to bring it to you. Um, we are, yes, please, please, please. We are delighted to offer you the award for best guest ever. <laughs> I'm sure. You've had some illustrious ones already. Here it is. Thank you so much. So this is a mug. Don't get too much excited. Is it filled? Uh, I don't know why you have my man card on the top. <laughs> Please keep it. It gives you a discount on the, at the bar downstairs. <laughs> oh, excellent. So you, you can open it if you want. It's, it's Dero Documentary Official Mug. Well, thank you so much. I hope it will be uh, useful in the office or on set. I'm sure it will be. <laughs> That's all for this episode of Filming in Thailand, recorded live from Tero Radio Studios in the heart of Bangkok, Thailand. That's a wrap. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. That was Filming in Thailand, an original podcast brought to you by Tero Documentary on Rudy Podcast with your host, Stefan Lombe. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for our next episode of Filming in Thailand. You know, as I get older, I find that the things that bring people together are food, music, and travel. Filming in Thailand, an original podcast brought to you by Tarot Documentary on Hoodie Podcast with your host, Stefan Lambert. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for our next episode.